So I'm actually going to uh, just talk about two things, two big debates uh, within the history of the 1971 war. And uh, as an example of all the things that remain unsettled history, and how that has filtered into the war crimes debate, and then finally into Shabbat itself. Because in some ways, although we'll have uh, many panelists who tell you about the nature of the war crimes, uh, the legal issue of crime war crimes, uh, the political backlash that has happened, um, the way I see it, this is not just about war crimes, but about battles, about events, which are still not settled. And in some ways, the problem is that uh, war crimes alone are being used to try to settle these debates in a very incomplete way. Um, so I want to just talk about two aspects um, of 1971 history, just to give an example of how many debates still remain completely unresolved and divide the country. Uh, so the basic contours of the war, for those uh, who do not know, from 1947 to 1971, Bangladesh was part of Pakistan, it was known as East Pakistan, and starting from 1952 onwards, uh, the issue of East Pakistan and its possible separation from West Pakistan or Pakistan started bubbling up, starting with the language riots of 1952, uh, gradually progressing through all sorts of events uh, which I'll not get into here. But just to mention one big marker, which is the 1965 India-Pakistan War, which is insufficiently discussed in this context, <coughs> because that was the first time that East Pakistan also started saying that our defenses are not safe because all of the military establishment is in West Pakistan. So it's interesting because a lot of the debate happens around language. Uh, but military power was also part of the equation um, about East Pakistan wanting uh, their own military center, which also transmitted or connected with various economic debates, which built up to 1968, uh, 1969, and then 1970. 1970 was technically Pakistan's first quote-unquote free and fair election based on universal franchise, one person, one vote. Instead of previous formulas where um, it would be based on provisional divisions. Um, and in 1970, the East Pakistan side won an overwhelming victory, uh, which meant technically that a Bengali, Sheikh Mujib actually, was supposed to be the Prime Minister of all of Pakistan, uh, which is actually the mandate for the election. It wasn't a separation mandate. Um, and then the negotiations broke down, and the 1971 war began. began. Uh, I'm collapsing a lot of history together in the interest of time, because I want to get to the unsettled uh, part of history, because in some ways, a lot of this is at least settled by the fact of Bangladesh existing as an independent country. Um, so the 1971 war, which separated Bangladesh from Pakistan, is a nine-month war. Uh, it's broadly characterized as a brutal and genocidal war, um, in which a huge number, even the number is disputed, of Bengalis were killed, and there was a policy of uh, wartime rape. And then Bangladesh becomes an independent country. Um, what I find interesting, and what actually Shahbag is all about, is the debates that start after December 16, 1971. Because in many ways, a lot of the debates that have happened since December 1971, in odd ways, don't really involve Pakistan. They involve Bangladesh itself. Um, and a deep split inside Bangladesh about the meaning of 1971. So I just want to talk about two episodes, which have been discussed uh, before, but I think they're worth discussing. One is the idea of crucial speeches and missing segments of um, speeches. Uh, and I want to talk about two people who are iconic, both in terms of 1971 and in terms of the politics that has been created since, um, which is um, Sheikh Mujib, who is um, the founding president of Bangladesh and the leader of the Army League, and then uh, General Zia Rahman, who was the army officer uh, who came into power in 1975 and eventually founded the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. Uh, the two parties are essentially something like a yin and yang. Um, I have written in essays sometimes that the Army League is slightly left of center and the BNP slightly right of center, but those characterizations don't really mean anything once you get deep into the issues, because increasingly they move closer and closer to each other, uh, and in some ways the only difference now is how they see 1971 and what happened after 1971. So many of the debates that happen in Bangladesh today are not, for example, about whether uh, a company like Asia Energy should be allowed to do open pit coal mining, because on this both uh, parties agree, but on 1971. Uh, which is why history continues to be continuously relevant, because it becomes the one way uh, for the two parties to differentiate each other. And one of the big controversies of 1971, we actually shot, saw a fragment of it in Khan, is who gave the speech uh, and what did they say that declared Bangladesh as an independent nation. So the image on the left is Sheikh Mujib giving the famous speech on March 7th, which is broadly um, known as the speech where he first declared, this time the struggle is for freedom. Um, it's an interesting speech if you read the whole thing. Um, there's a book that's just come out called The Bangladesh Reader, 
which actually uh, prints the speech in its entirety. Because on the one hand, it gives the fall to become an independent country. On the other hand, he's still technically supposed to be prime minister of Pakistan. And the negotiations have not fully broken down. So both are in there. So that's supposed to be an independent speech. Uh, and then uh, Zia, who was not a general at that time, gave a speech um, from Chittagong radio station uh, the day after um, 26 March, where he, because Sheikh Mujib was already in jail at that time, because he had been arrested um, by the Pakistan army already, gave an announcement in the name of Sheikh Mujib. Now, these two speeches are incredibly debated um, inside Bangladesh, where, as a history project, uh, the BNP has, while in power, tried in various ways to make the speech on the left disappear or come into question. And then the Aumi League has, in all sorts of ways, tried to make the speech on the right um, disappear. Um, it's a, you know, it's interesting, you know, I don't know if you'd call it a sibling or an Oedipal complex, but it's an interesting battle as to who started Bangladesh, who deserves credit for Bangladesh. And each side, this is the interesting part, um, sees the debate exactly in their terms. I am 100% right, and the other side is um, completely wrong. So that's one thing I want to talk about, which is the trend of um, history and missing documents in our history, so that nothing is settled history even 42 years later. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, which uh, does connect to Shaba, is the idea of Rajakar, uh, homegrown Rajakar, as a proxy for Pakistan. So if you look at the 1971 war, uh, the overwhelming brute force is applied by the Pakistan army. So you would presume that a project for justice after 1971 would focus on the Pakistan army. And if you look at the narratives, for example, you know, after World War II, the famous example, the war crimes trials very specifically focused on bringing members of the German army to book, etc., etc., in all the various war crimes trials that have happened since. But in Bangladesh, the debate about 1971, interesting enough, isn't really about the Pakistan army. Um, although it does come up, although obviously Pakistan comes up and Pakistan is the other uh, that is to be measured against, most of the debate inside Bangladesh happens about Rajakars which are basically Bengali or Urdu-speaking uh, members, citizens of East Pakistan who were part of the collaborating forces with the Pakistan army during the war. So these are people technically living in East Pakistan, technically citizens of East Pakistan, which when East Pakistan declares them to be a separate country, they become the fifth column inside the country. Uh, they become basically the people who form uh, the local death squads that assist the Pakistan army. Now, if you look at the overall war and nine-month war, the overwhelming brute force is, of course, applied by the Pakistan army as a fully armed army, etc. Uh, but in the Bangladesh context, uh, the focus has been entirely on the local collaborators. Uh, and I just want to show very quickly uh, a screenshot from two films. This is a film made in 1972, Hurai Agarujan, So you have the fearsome Pakistan soldier, but then most importantly, you have the homegrown uh, Bengali collaborator. These are the two members of a village peace committee who in the scene are discussing how they should um, help the Pakistan army. And they're Bengali or they're Urdu speaking or from their clothing they're presumed to be more Islamic minded etc. So these are all sort of broad stereotypes. And then 40 years later another film called Meherjan uh, which shows the same iconography. Um, again a village elder, in this case Victor Banerjee, um, approached by a local Rajakar saying you know we should form a peace squad, and then the dialogue is very similar. What's the point of clashing with our Pakistani Muslim brothers? So, what's interesting about Shahbagh, and we'll get into this, of course, is that the debate and the discussion about war crimes focuses entirely on local uh, collaborators, not the Pakistan army. So, the demands of Shahbagh are very much also about local. And the other as aspect of it, which I'm sure the other panelists will also talk about, is that when you talk about local collaborators. <coughs> But you also talk about people who you may not have brought to trial for 42 years. It would be incorrect to presume that for 42 years they've just been sitting quietly and waiting to be tried. Obviously in those 42 years, those forces or those individuals, usually forces, have also gathered strength and rebuilt themselves and also created an alternative narrative of what happened in 1971. And presumably, uh, presuming that one day this day would come, they've also gathered energy to try to fight back against war crimes. So that's a singular thing to understand also, that Shahbag is coming in the context of war crimes trials that are bringing people to trial that are also able to fight back pretty systematically in some ways with more, I would say, I don't know, funding or firepower or global connections 
but in some ways more effectively than the government has been able to. And then obviously the other thing we mentioned is that Shabag is happening in 2013 in the context of the politics since 2001, where the Muslim or the Muslim other or the Muslim within quotes or Islamist, all of these things are highly debated and disputed terms and the world is much more interested in these things in a way they would not have been interested, let's say, in 72, 73, 74. So all of these things are playing into the current war crimes trials and I think um, in some ways, we'll get into this, you know, Shahbag in some ways is an internal battle inside Bangladesh, which ironically doesn't involve Pakistan. And it's a battle between two sides, if we can use the term broadly, and the two sides are much more equal in strength in some ways now than they were, let's say, in 1972. So that's one last thing to keep in mind.